So I know there's going to be some opinions just based on the title, but hear me out. Status conditions have a massive impact on the overall design of Dungeons & Dragons, even if it's not always explicit or overt. The things that your character can do, all of the power that they have, it's all counterbalanced by the assumption that they are able to actually do those things. And that's where status conditions come into play. These 15 simple words, blinded, charmed, deafened, exhausted, frightened, grappled, incapacitated, invisible, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, prone, restrained, stunned, and unconscious, all have the capacity to dictate in their own way what a given creature can actually do. The problem, though, is that not all status conditions are actually created equally. And I don't mean equality in terms of severity. It is perfectly fine for one condition to create a much more dire or severe scenario than another one would. However, they all should have some form of counterplay, even if that counterplay is nothing but a reasonable function of time. When your character loses all agency off the back of a single poor roll and there's nothing that anyone can do about it, this creates a situation that just isn't really fun for anyone. The condition that I'm not so subtly referring to is the stun condition. Something designed and implemented so questionably that I often wonder why it even exists and I'm really hoping to see disappear once the 2024 books are released, even if I don't actually expect it to. Speaking of stunned, I'm stunned by all the support from everyone recently. I'm already getting really close to hitting my February goal of 6,000 subscribers, so if you like what I do and you want to help out, a sub to the channel would be, well, stunning. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Also, shout out to my members Jackal3 in the Hero tier and Julio and my newest member SirenXY in the Warrior tier. I couldn't do this without you guys. So if you'd also like to help support me for as little as $1 per month, click on the join button to check out all the awesome benefits that go along with it. So before we get into exactly why I think the stun condition is problematic, I think it's important to really get a feel for status conditions in general, what they're trying to accomplish, and what good designs already exist in this space. Status conditions, at their core, help to provide depth to the combat system and provide interactivity between characters and monsters. They're what help give certain attacks meaning and narrative context within combat. They're what help to standardize some of the most common things that can occur during an encounter. They're what takes creatures from just being bags of hit points into these real living things. Without any status conditions, combat can really just become a simple math problem, and while that certainly can be fun, i found that, particularly as levels increase, incorporation of status conditions can really help spice up combat. At the end of the day, tabletop RPGs are all about decision making and agency, and while you can absolutely make valid and interesting decisions based on hit points alone, it's the incorporation of status conditions that add a whole new layer of depth. Becoming blinded might not necessarily prohibit you from doing most things, but it can severely limit your choice or force you to make some new ones. Spells that rely on sight can no longer be cast, however, you can still make attacks, they're just made at disadvantage as you can kind of rely on your other senses to make it work. However, attacks against you now also have advantage, so the new decision becomes whether you stay around and do your best to hit, or do you run and hide since you have a significantly higher chance at taking some damage. And sure, some amount of unavoidable metagaming can come into play here, but that doesn't detract from the fact that a decision is still being made. Becoming poisoned and having disadvantage on all attack rolls and ability checks can be absolutely debilitating, depending on the type of character that you're playing at least. If you're primarily a martial character making attacks, this can really impact you, but if you're a backline spellcaster, the impact may not be as great as you just aren't going to be making all that many attack rolls or ability checks comparatively. Now, it could still impact the types of spells that you want to cast since many cantrips rely on attack rolls, so maybe now you feel kind of forced into burning more spell slots than you'd otherwise want to. All of these micro-level decisions are part of what, in my eyes at least, make these status conditions interesting. I think the prone condition is actually an example of a really well-designed condition. It seems so simple and uninteresting on the face of it, but there's actually really a lot of mechanical nuance to it that I find help it stand out. Just so we're all on the same page, here is the effect for the prone condition. A prone creature's only movement option is to crawl, unless it stands up and thereby ends the condition. The creature has disadvantage on attack rolls, an attack roll against the creature has advantage if the attacker is within 5 feet of the creature, otherwise the attack roll has disadvantage. These three short bullet points have a lot more going on with them than you might realize. Firstly, with you being prone, your only movement option is to crawl. This is, mechanically speaking at least, difficult terrain, which means your movement speed is effectively halved. So if getting somewhere quickly is important, it may be valuable to just stand and run. However, standing consumes half of your speed, meaning, assuming you don't dash, you're going to get exactly as far as you would have had you crawled. 
but standing sets you up better for subsequent turns. Also, since standing consumes movement, you also provoke opportunity attacks from any threatening creatures, so this is also an important consideration that you need to make. Then comes all the attack questions. As long as you're prone, you're attacking at disadvantage. Is that even a problem? Do you need to be attacking? But attacks within 5 feet of you are made at advantage, but range attacks are made at disadvantage, so what types of enemies are surrounding you? Depending on the type of scenario that you're in, prone can even be used to great effect defensively when combined with the athlete feat, which allows you to stand from prone by only using 5 feet of movement. This can allow you to stand and run and get down quickly again to avoid large amounts of range attackers. The whole point that I'm trying to illustrate here is that prone, despite appearing to be a fairly bland and really nothing more than just being on the ground, introduces myriad tactical decisions that can all be acted on in different ways depending on the situation at hand, and I find that to be really interesting and well designed. Even if some elements like always standing taking half your speed are a little bit weird. Now let's talk about the not so well designed condition, stunned. I was honestly pretty surprised when I ran a poll in this last week when I asked what people thought of it. At the time of writing, with 621 votes, it is perfectly split, with 42% liking it and 42% not liking it, with 17 not having a preference either way. Obviously, this doesn't add up to 100, so YouTube is rounding one of these results. Either way, it is super close. So let's take a look at the stun condition itself. It reads, a stun condition is incapacitated. It can't move and can speak only falteringly. For reference, the incapacitated condition provides that you can't take actions or reactions. The creature automatically fails strength and dexterity saving throws, and attack rolls against the creature have advantage. Something that I think is important to mention here, as it's possible that many aren't actually aware, you might be wondering if you can still take a bonus action on your turn. None of the listed conditions above explicitly state that you can't. Incapacitated simply states that you can't take actions or reactions, but it says nothing of bonus actions, and neither does the rest of the condition text. However, in Chapter 9 of the Player's Handbook, under the section The Order of Combat, then your turn, and then bonus action, on the last line of the third paragraph, it reads, Anything that deprives you of your ability to take actions also prevents you from taking a bonus action. Strictly from a layout perspective, this is ridiculous. These two rules need to be repatriated and brought together into the same section. The crazy thing is that at the top of Appendix A in the PHB, where the conditions are located, there already exists a section with various notes on conditions, and for some reason, this one isn't there. Please, for the 2024 books, move these all together. Anyway, stunned. When discussing it, there's two things that we need to consider. Design and implementation. Design-wise, the condition is extremely powerful. It can be overwhelming to a creature affected by it, it completely strips them of their agency and decision making, and can result in disengagement from a player, which is obviously not what they're going for. The stun character simply can't do anything until the effect ends. For clarity though, this doesn't necessarily mean on its own that the condition is poorly designed. If the condition always only lasted for one round, I don't think it would be as problematic, and it would also probably separate itself a little bit more from its partner in crime, Paralyzed. Now, you might find it odd that I'm not talking about Paralyzed, since the effect is literally exactly the same, but worse. Any attack that hits a creature that is paralyzed is an automatic critical hit if the attacker is within 5 feet. This can make for an extremely deadly condition if applied at the right time during combat. So why is it then that I'm talking about stunned and not paralyzed? Design-wise, they are incredibly similar, and for clarity, I can even understand why they wanted a condition like stun to exist. In my own personal canon, I think of paralyzed affecting your physicality, your muscles, your body. Everything tightens up and it prevents you from moving, whereas the stun condition is more of a mental or emotional condition. And while these do largely yield the same effect, the means of obtaining them seem different, which can be a crucial distinction and can also help differentiate them a little bit more. On that note, let's talk about the implementation so we can establish why I think stunned is more problematic than paralyzed. Firstly, the way you become affected by the condition is inconsistent and seemingly lacks logic. An Otiag's tentacle slam attack is described as either slamming two creatures grappled by it together or into some other solid surface, dealing bludgeoning damage and rendering the target stunned until the end of the Otiag's next turn. So right off the bat, this feels to me like it should have caused the paralyzed effect, not stunned. Everything about this kind of screams physicality, but in any case, again, that's more of my internal designer coming out and not anything that the team has actually stated should be the case. So it's neither here nor there. Anyway though, this effect at least has a defined end, which is great, except that the Otiog could absolutely chain the stun on each turn, preventing any escape, 
provided that the target continues to fail their DC-14 constitution save. The extra gross thing here is that you can't even attempt to break the grapple if you're stunned, since breaking it requires an action, and you can't take any actions while you're stunned. So you're basically just at the mercy of the dice gods here. And honestly, if this was the extent of how stunned worked, I don't think it would even be so bad. And it can also be so easy to just say, well, most monsters just cause the effect for one round anyway, so it's not so bad. And this might have been the case in the earlier days of 5e with creatures like the Otiug and the Vrock, but more recently, there has been a growing trend to have the effect last for a full minute. Yes, you do get to repeat the save at the end of your turn, but you're still essentially guaranteed to miss at least one turn, and many of the DCs are high and on fairly unreliable saves. I think one of the most well-known versions of this is the Mind Flare, which incidentally is from the 2014 Monster Manual. It has the Mind Blast ability, which forces a DC 15 intelligence saving throw to all creatures within a 60-foot cone, taking psychic damage on a failed save and becoming stunned. Firstly, the 60-foot cone is just massive. That's hitting just about anything on the battlefield. Secondly, it's on a recharge ability, so it doesn't even technically consume a resource and has a 33% chance to be usable every single turn. Third, unlike most powerful recharge effects that if you save against you become immune to for the next 24 hours, like the Ultra Lost Hypnotic Gaze feature or a Dragon's Breath weapon, this is not the case here. Fourth, it targets an intelligence save, probably the least reliable save in the game from the target's perspective. Finally, all this combined with the Extract Brain feature is just a death sentence waiting to happen. It's really not hard to see how this can chain stun your entire party and lead to a TPK unless you're a wizard with a solid intelligence modifier, because you're going to be needing some really above average rolls to break this stun. Some other examples are the Steel Predator from Monsters of the Multiverse, which can also cause a stun condition on a failed DC-19 constitution saving throw, also in a 60-foot cone. The Sioux Monster from Tomb of Annihilation requires a DC-11 wisdom save, but this is from a CR-1 creature, and the effect also lasts for a full minute. The Amnizu from Monsters of the Multiverse targets anything within 60 feet of itself, it forces a DC-18 intelligence save, and has you stunned for one minute on a fail. Probably the most egregious example of bad design for this comes from the recent Planescape book though, with the Septon Modron. I swear, it feels like they forgot how stunned even works. The Lightning Network feature forces any creature within a 30-foot cube originating from the Modron to make a DC-16 dexterity saving throw, taking lightning damage and becoming stunned for one minute on a failed save. The hilarious part here is that it explicitly includes the text to say that the creature can repeat the save at the end of their turn to end the stun. However, if you remember the stun condition, you'd also remember that stun creatures automatically fail dexterity saving throws, which effectively makes the stun a guaranteed full minute, so the creature essentially gets 10 uninterrupted rounds to kill your group. Now yeah, you could say that this is an example of a situation where the specific overrules general rule would come into play. Lightning Network explicitly allows you to make a deck save at the end of your turn to end the condition, but the general rule of stun makes it so you automatically fail the save, so you could argue that the text in the feature is the correct answer, but this is really just a shiny example of the issues present with the condition. Which actually brings me to my next point. The worst part of stunned isn't even how debilitating it can be when it works even though that is absolutely savage. The real thing about the condition that makes it so problematic is that the designers have seemed to have forgotten to include any reasonably accessible way to end the condition. Something which is not true of the paralyzed condition. It's almost like they intended to only have it last for a single round, so they didn't actually need to implement any way around it. But then they changed their mind, they made it last for a full minute in a lot of cases, and then didn't create any way to stop the effect. As far as I can tell, there is exactly one spell in the game that can end the stun condition, and it is 9th level Power Word Heal. So you're telling me that the only magic strong enough to end this condition becomes available once a spellcaster reaches at least 17th level? That is crazy to me. Literally, as written, not even Wish in any of its basic uses can end the effect, but I guess you could chance it with some of the alternate suggestions. Aura of Purity gives advantage on the save though, so I guess there's that. The only class feature I could find that ends the stun condition is the 6th level Way of Mercy Monk's Healing Hands feature, but this obviously requires you to not only have a monk in your party, but that they also chose the Way of Mercy subclass. 
So where Paralyze can be ended with a simple second level cast of Lesser Restoration, and spell effects that cause the Paralyze condition like Hold Monster and Hold Person are concentration spells, so they also have a fairly easily identifiable way to end them. And like I mentioned at the beginning, one that involves some level of counterplay from the party. You can also even preemptively prevent Paralysis from taking effect by casting Freedom of Movement, which makes them immune to the Paralyzed condition, but for some reason, not the Stun condition. It makes no sense. It's also worth mentioning that Power Word Heal does also cure Paralysis. I want to be extremely clear about something here. I don't think that the Stun condition in and of itself is a problem. The real core issue with the effect is its implementation in the game. It feels extremely half-baked and almost forgotten about, which has led to a situation where it is probably far more powerful than the designers had actually intended it to be. There are a few fixes that I think can be made to resolve many of the issues with the condition as it currently exists, many of which I've already touched on during this video. Firstly, make the way that it manifests itself at least be consistent and differentiate itself from Paralyzed. Have it so maybe Stunned is exclusively a mental save and targets Wisdom, Intelligence, or Charisma saves. Secondly, make it so the effect only lasts for one round, or if you want the effect to last longer than one round, have the creature cause paralysis instead. And if there's no logical reason why it can cause paralysis, well, then the design of the creature doesn't really overlap very well with the intended effects. Finally, and this one depends on whether they actually adopt fix number two that I just mentioned, if they make it always last one round, nothing really needs to change. There doesn't necessarily need to be a way to end a one round condition, though it would be nice if it couldn't be chained together. However, if they keep it so there's plenty of one minute durations for the condition, they need to implement some more broadly accessible ways of actually ending it. Honestly, even having an ally take their action to shake the creature to snap them out of their stunned stupor, similar to how sleep can be ended, would be a good enough answer here. Or if they don't like any of those options, they can just take their own design and run with that. The 1D&D on Earth Arcana process has introduced a new status condition, Dazed, which I honestly believe can, and probably should, effectively replace Stunned entirely. The new Dazed condition makes it so that you can either move or take one action on your turn, not both. It also specifically prevents you from taking a bonus action or a reaction. This condition has largely the same effect as Stunned, without being nearly as debilitating and without nearly as much overlap with the Paralyzed condition. And it also doesn't completely deprive the player of their ability to still play the game in some way, and nor does it deprive them of using their own resources to potentially end the effect either. I even think it could be possible to see Stun disappear entirely from the 2024 books. In previous videos, Chris Perkins and Jeremy Crawford have mentioned that there will be a section in the upcoming Player's Handbook that explains how to essentially adapt or convert 2014 material to work with the new books. One of those instructions could simply read, anywhere the stun condition appears, replace it with the dazed condition. I think this would probably be for the best and the most elegant solution to a problem which the team seems to have potentially created by accident. If you enjoyed this video and want to help me hit that 6,000 subscriber mark by the end of the month, a sub to the channel would be amazing. Also, check out my Discord server and some of my other D&D videos. But otherwise, take care.